gravity has only a local effect. The sun's gravity barely reaches past the edge of the heliosphere. Its farthest known reaches to the Kuiper belt, and the farthest edge of what is called the scattered disk at roughly 15 billion kilometers distance from the Earth, or roughly 15 ten thousandths of a light year. Gravity plays no role on the galactic scale, that is a billion times larger in size than the solar system. Only the electric force can play a role here, which is 36 orders of magnitude stronger and does not diminish with the square of the distance. Researchers at the Los Alamos National Laboratory believe that cosmic electric current streams can reach across the small interstellar spaces within the galaxies and also in the form of extremely large Brooklyn current streams extending across more than a billion light years of space. These long Brooklyn currents are vast electric power streams in which entire galaxies and also entire clusters of galaxies are located. The point is that by understanding the dynamic forces that act on our climate, both small and large, it becomes possible to more accurately understand the Ice Age dynamics and the relevant precursors. If we look at the last half of the 62 million year cycle from its highest to its lowest point, which is 31 million years in duration, we can locate the high point in the early part of the thaw out of Antarctica 20 million years ago. This puts the lowest point of the 62 million year cycle 10 million years past the present. This means that we have not yet seen the lowest point of the current Ice Age epoch, the Pleistocene epoch. The point is that successive Ice Ages will become increasingly colder for the next 10 million years. It shatters the hope that we may have come to the end of the glaciation cycles, or at least see them becoming milder. Instead, the opposite is the case, which increases the challenge that humanity faces in the near term, when the interglacial ends and the transition begins to the next glaciation. In other words, the interglacial warm holiday is coming to an end for humanity, possibly even before the middle of the present century. The time has come, therefore, to get serious about protecting our agriculture, that our existence on this planet depends on. The Polish professor Zbigniew Jaworowski points out that the transition to the deep freeze glaciation climate is not something that takes thousands of years to happen, but will happen quickly, and when it does, it will affect large areas simultaneously, even beyond the areas into which the ice sheets previously extended. It is known, for example, that during the last ice age the permafrost region had extended far into the south, past peaking in China. That's not something to be taken lightly. The resulting circle of the deep cooling also encapsulates Madrid, Rome, Berlin, and Moscow, and on the American continent, it encapsulates San Francisco and Washington, D.C., and of course all of Canada. It is believed that the winter sea ice had extended as far south as Los Angeles during the last glaciation period, and likewise past Washington, D.C., on the East Coast. In other words, the USA quickly reverts to tundra-like conditions when the Ice Age transition begins with permafrost developing in the ground. It doesn't take a great genius to realize that these kinds of conditions are disastrous for agriculture. Canada, one of the world's big grain producer, would be the first to see its agriculture disabled by the transition to glacial conditions. Agriculture is what Canada's very existence depends on. A nation that cannot feed itself is a dead nation. The vast majority of humanity's food supply comes from agriculture, especially from grains, which are also the major feedstock for meat production. We cannot afford the loss of this resource. The supplies to the whole world. Let's take Peking as a rough reference point for what areas become included in the unfolding permafrost region. Peking is located close to the 40 degrees northern latitude. If one draws a line across the world at the 40 degree latitude, both in the north and the south, it becomes apparent that a large portion of the world's food production area is located above the northern 40 degree line, where agriculture will grind to a halt fairly quickly. While the unfolding Ice Age conditions will likely extend beyond that line, the line is a good reference point for where the devastation will be felt first. The area behind this line covers nearly all of Europe except for the southernmost parts of Spain, Italy, and Greece. It also covers all of Russia, including the Ukraine, 
and the northern parts of China. On the American continent it covers all of Canada and the northern parts of the USA. It is hard to imagine what the effect will be when the biggest chunk of the world food production becomes suddenly disabled and the all across the board simultaneously. Unfortunately, this is about to happen. It will destroy much of humanity if the compensating preparations have not been made by then to secure our food supply. The needed preparations for the coming Ice Age climate are not easily made on the required scale. While agricultural production can be increased in many areas with advanced methods, there simply isn't enough land available where the upgrading can be done to compensate for the huge northern losses. This means that it becomes absolutely necessary to compensate the major parts of the agricultural loss with indoor agriculture on a vast scale and to develop the great deserts into agricultural regions such as the Sahara and also to put agriculture afloat onto the sea. The Sahara is the world's largest great desert. It extends across 9.4 million square kilometers. However, the area lacks the water resources to make this land productive. It is not a small task to import sufficient water to irrigate 9 million square kilometers of land. However, it is possible to do this. The water and the materials to do this are available. The Amazon River, for example, dumps every second over 200,000 cubic meters of fresh water into the Atlantic Ocean. The technology and the materials do exist to harvest this water and to channel it through arteries floating in the oceans all the way to Africa in order to bring the Sahara into agricultural production. The outflow of the Congo River could be added to the system. All of Africa could be richly developed on this platform. The same principle could also be applied to utilize the outflow of the Mississippi River in North America to activate the North American Great Deserts. The principle is simple. Transferring water in submerged arteries is relatively effortless, as no elevation differences need to be overcome. The water is thereby brought to the shore of a destination area where it can be simply pumped into region-wide distribution networks with the use of nuclear power. Some say, this will never happen. Oh, really? Is it too expensive for mankind to do this? Oh, how much is life worth? Has it become too expensive to live? The answer is that the construction of the infrastructures that are needed for humanity to survive is easily possible with the utilization of the salt as a material processed in automated high-temperature industrial engines powered by the liquid Florida thorium nuclear reactor, which is safe and for which vast fuel resources exist that are presently unused. The vast sandy deserts, like the Sahara, could become the bread garden of the world that could tide us over the coming Ice Age deep freeze. It won't be easy to develop this vast sandy wilderness, but it is possible. It may take two decades to create the necessary infrastructures that enable the Sahara to bloom. Of course, without this type of vast-scale infrastructure development mankind is doomed to suffer a vast reduction in its population that few will see the end of. We must not forget that the total human world population that made it through the last ice age after roughly 2 million years of human development, was only 1 to 10 million people strong. This minuscule population was all that the primitive Earth had been able to support during the last Ice Age environment. We no longer need to be limited by this factor. For the first time ever in geologic history, we, as an intelligent species, have created the technological capability on this planet to avoid a traditional Ice Age fate. Whether or not we realize this potential is determined by our care to apply our capability. With all of us working together, we can accomplish the necessary feat. If we fail, the human journey may end, at least for most people. This means that upgrading Africa must be acknowledged as the first necessary critical step to assure the continuing survival of humanity. Upgrading Africa must be the first step for the simple reason that it is the fastest to accomplish. But we cannot stop there. Upgrading Africa must happen in parallel with creating floating agriculture in the tropics and with developing indoor agriculture. These three development projects are the highest priority requirements for the survival and the welfare of the whole of humanity. Upgrading Africa into a bread garden requires the involvement of every nation. In order to facilitate the needed large scale development, 
a network of efficient transportation infrastructures is required, including a network of floating bridges spanning the oceans for efficient rail transportation. The building of such a network of floating bridges, with 25,000 kilometers in total length, may seem like an impossible dream. However, when large-scale automated industrial production is applied to the task, and nuclear power, to melt the salt, as the construction material, very little effort in terms of human labor is actually required to build the bridges. Once the industrial infrastructures are created, and the process is automated, it runs essentially, hands-free. Far fewer people will be required for this than are presently engaged in military operations. For the second phase, the intercontinental bridges will serve as transportation links for the large-scale floating agriculture modules that will be laid out across the tropical oceans where the climate is the warmest and the atmospheric CO2 density the highest. Once the automated technology is developed and the industries have been created for it, it becomes easier than to place new agriculture afloat onto the oceans than it is to upgrade the deserts. Placing them into the tropics puts them far out of the reach of the Ice Age cooling. If all of the currently endangered agriculture would be placed afloat onto the oceans, less than 2% of the ocean's area would be required, a rather minuscule amount. The automated high temperature processes, for melting and reshaping basalt into any form of construction module is also bound to spark a complete new industrial revolution in the world. It will, for example, spark a revolution in housing. With the basalt-based automated processes and higher housing modules can be produced so inexpensively that the produced housing units can be provided universally for free as an investment by society and to itself. Free housing thus becomes a part of the new industrial revolution that enables the floating bridges to be built and the floating agriculture. Homelessness ends at this point. Slum living and rent slavery becomes a thing of the past. In the case of floating agriculture, complete towns and cities will be assembled and become integrated elements of the floating infrastructures when the northern regions become disabled by the increasing snow and colder temperatures, a vast migrations of people will become necessary. People then begin to relocate to the more livable climates. In many cases the resulting vast migration of people will follow the relocation of their agriculture. However, a migration on this scale will only be possible with the automated production of housing. That enables the rapid building of new cities and new industrial centers. Africa and parts of South America will become the new home for the displaced people of the Ice Age disabled countries, such as Canada, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Russia, China, and also England, Ireland, Germany, France, and so on. Traditional housing construction cannot supply the coming needs that the mass migration will impose. The capacity to implement universal free housing already existed in the USA from the 1950s on. The USA has a major flood basalt province that contains enough basalt to cover the entire USA deeper than a man stands tall. Basalt is lava, a stone with an extremely fine grain. It melts at 1,200 degrees Celsius for the production of anything from large construction modules to microfibers thinner than a human hair. Basalt is also 10 times stronger than steel, at half the weight, and is nearly as hard as diamonds. And it is easy to use. The basalt sits process ready on the ground. No pre-processing is required, as in the case of steel production, where the pre-processing is extensive. For basalt, all what is needed to utilize this material is high temperature process heat, and this is easily provided with a molten salt thorium nuclear reactor. The molten salt thorium reactor is a safe and simple high temperature nuclear reactor with passive safety and no need for a pressure vessel. It had been developed in the 1950s, but had been shelved since it doesn't produce any byproducts that are useful for making atom bombs. China, India, and Singapore are presently beginning to redevelop the molten salt thorium reactor as an inexpensive infrastructure for electric power production. To date, it has not been slated for high-temperature industrial processes. But this won't be far off.